Welcome back to the Thermodat Podcast. I'm your host, Jayden Miller, and today I have on the podcast Kitty Blumfield and Kate Deering. Um, I'm super excited for y'all to be able to listen to this one. So we talk about uh, both of these women's backgrounds, um, some of the simple but high leverage things that they've implemented uh, for themselves or for clients, um, some things that they're focusing on or interested in right now. Um, kind of what a day in the life looks like for each of them. And then um, we talk uh, about a whole other range of topics as we start discussing different things. So let's dive in. Welcome back. Today, I have none other than Kitty Bloomfield on the podcast with me and Kate Deering. How y'all doing today? Awesome. Happy to be here. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Definitely. Um, So I guess uh, we'll start off with Kitty and then work our way around to Kate. Um, Do you mind kind of telling everybody where you're coming from and kind of what you do? Yeah. So, um, and like we were talking about before, like Kate and I have pretty similar backgrounds and we have our birthdays nearly on the same day. Well, it's actually on the same day because of the time difference, but Kate's just nine years. She's got nine years on me of partying. Um, (laughs) But I really, God, I remember starting drinking when I was in high school, you know, like we'd go out and get shit faced on the weekend and I lost my virginity when I was 17 at this party and it lasted about one minute. And then I just had these bad body image issues after that. And I think that's what started the dieting, you know, cause I just wanted to be skinny because I thought that if I was skinny, men would, you know, find me attractive and I'd find a man. So I just went on this crazy, like probably for 10 years or 17 years really, but drank, partied, took drugs, did every diet under the sun. Like the funny thing was, and I think back to it now, I was like, oh, I'm so healthy. I'm so healthy because I would like eat no sugar during the week and cut dairy and do all this exercise. And then I'd go out on the weekend and take drugs and get shit faced. And then I'd start this vicious cycle again on Monday. Um, And I like the drugs too, because they kept me skinny, you know, because you just would never be hungry. I I remember there was a point when I was at uni and I was just addicted to speed. So I'd get up in the morning and I'd have a line of speed and have just the black coffee for breakfast. Then I would smoke as well. So, yeah, I just, I did that for ages and then I got married. Um, Obviously I stopped sleeping with all men then when I got married. Um, (laughs) Well, I did actually cheat on my husband too, which I'm not proud of, but I just, I probably married the safe guy, but the dieting really continued through then, you know, and I ended up competing three times in fitness competitions because it was just a way for me to restrict um, and have a reason to restrict and stick to my, you know, crazy, rigid, sugar-free, dairy-free, low-calorie diets. And I didn't realize back then, but I had, I guess my biggest issues were hormonal. So like I didn't have, I was a bit bloated and constipated, but you know, like a lot, some people who really restrict have really bad digestive issues, but I had really painful and irregular periods. I had a miscarriage. I had polyps removed. I had a DNC. I had precancerous cells removed of my cervix. I think back now to that and I would never have got that surgery, but obviously I didn't know, you know, I didn't understand health like I understand it now. Um, and yeah, I ended up getting divorced and then did another six months stint of partying and shagging every guy that I could find and taking drugs and starving myself and, you know, getting down to like 56 kilos. So I'm about, I don't know, 69, 70 kilos now and I'm five foot eight. So you can imagine how skinny I was at 56 kilos. Uh, and then I was actually seeing this therapist and we would always talk about nutrition and she's like, Oh, have you ever, um, read the work of this guy called Ray Pete and MR Scaracus, the nutrition coach who's now my business partner in Satray. And I was like, oh no. So off I went and started reading all that stuff. And I was like, oh my God, this makes so much sense. You know, like I've been restricting sugar and carbs and dairy all my life. No wonder I'm binge eating. No wonder I feel so shitty. Um, and so then I emailed Emma and I was like, I just have to work with you. You have to take me on as a client. And so, yeah, she worked with me for 12 weeks. And at the same time I met Craig and Craig is a PT. And so he's really into strength training and body recomposition. So basically he taught me how to strength train, which I just completely fell in love with and still love as, you know, you and I, Jayton, talk, talk about. He was actually telling me before how he went to the gym the other day and he's hit a triple for like 100 and, uh, in, in pounds, I think it was what, 325 bench. I was like, wow. That's impressive. Uh, it was yeah. 315. Yes, ma'am. 315, yeah. Because I'm like, well, how do I compete? But anyway, so I really, and I competed in powerlifting and I worked with Emma and just, you know, 
just went all, my personalities go all in. So I just ate so much food and quickly my weight, because I was putting on muscle and fat, quickly my weight increased. So I would sit probably around 60, 62 kilos, but I wasn't really so worried anymore about the scales because I was just loving being strong and lifting and fueling my body. And so I was working in mining then and Craig and I, I just was hating it. So I was doing FIFO, fly in, fly out, shift work. So seven on, seven off. And I was thinking about leaving and we ended up, we bought into this gym, which we shouldn't have done, you know, now when you look back, cause we didn't know anything about business. So we overpaid and I was just going to leave my mining job because I just hated it and was going to go back and work in recruitment. My dad's like, why don't you just go and work at the gym, Kitty? He's like, just go all in, just quit your job. If anyone can do it, you can, you know, because I'd got a good settlement from the divorce and saved a bit of money from working in mining. So we just ended up buying this gym, bought the, did it for six months, sort of it, it wasn't working with our current business partner. So we bought her out and then renamed it New Strength. And we did that for three years and then we started the online program for women and we sold the gym just before Corona hit, which was good. And then I partnered with Emma to do Saturday. So yeah, basically we just help women like me who have starved themselves and restricted sugar and done heaps of cardio to, I guess, like restore their metabolism and, you know, love their bodies again and get strong. Um, and yeah, just be healthy and happy um, and along the way, we met Kate, which is cool. Like we've known Kate for a, for a while now. Hey, it's been five five years. Yeah, maybe six. Yeah, so maybe we bought five. Kate's book and then started chatting with Kate. We do lots of podcasts together, and yeah, and that's just basically. And we're just still doing the same thing now. We've just got the Winner Life program, and Saturday is going to bring out some skincare soon, which is exciting. We've got our app coming out which has been stressful. Uh, lucky we eat so much sugar. Um, but, yeah, that's it. So, sorry, that was a bit of a long-winded, long-winded <laughs> explanation of who I am and what I do. So over to you, Kate. <laughs> We're just flipping right over. Uh, <clears throat> well, I, I guess I have a similar background uh, as Kitty does growing up. I mean, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, and I got into the health club business right out of college probably 22 and was into the health. I mean, I, it was, you know, I think a lot of people can relate to the fitness, especially women is when we get into the fitness industry, it's a great excuse for us to work out like crazy all the time and really be restricted with their eating. We think it's part of our job. So we, and we just decide this is what you do and this is how you live. And, you know, for a good part of the time that I was in the health club industry, it, it was interesting because I used to work out, I would seven days a week, two hours a day, one hour of cardio, one hour of weight. And I would eat 12 to 1400 calories of lean ground beef and vegetables and protein shakes and everything. And then I was also doing at that point because ephedra was still legal. And so I would do lots of ephedra to make sure I had plenty of energy to work out. And so if anyone doesn't know what ephedra is, it's basically like it was legal speed essentially. And they used to put it in fitness drinks and stuff before it became illegal and giving people heart attacks. But uh, it was definitely part of the fitness industry. So at that point, um, I don't know, I was probably 24, 25. And I, like Katie, got into the dark side of drugs and alcohol. Um, people don't know in the fitness industry, it's quite popular to be heavily into drugs, which is super sad. But it's the way that the fitness industry thinks we're going to stay thin and not drink a lot. Uh, and so, and everyone where I worked, I used to run health clubs in Atlanta. Uh, everybody was in it together. We were a team. And so it was quite normal when everybody does it. So we, you know, you ate really good on the weekend or the week and you partied like a crazy person on the weekend. And that became my life until at some point I probably was 30 or 31. I decided that what am I doing? Like, this isn't who I am and this isn't where I'm supposed to be. And I don't know. I had a, a, a deep reflection with myself um, after probably going out on a binge for two days. And I, at that point, decided that uh, I needed to get out of my environment. It wasn't healthy any longer. I needed to figure out who I was. And basically, at that point, I decided I was going to quit my job I'd had for 10 years, leave everything, and move across the country to California to figure out who the hell I was. And I honestly really didn't know. I came to California, had no job, no friends. 
I, I just, I didn't know anything. And it was a, a very weird experience to be somewhere where you didn't know anybody and you didn't have a job. And I was like, how do people even meet people here? So <clears throat> eventually my social life of drinking came back in. I was like, oh, I just go out and drink again. I'll meet everybody. And so I kind of bounced back into that a little bit until I kind of started to find my way. But long story short, I got big into the nutrition end of things. I started going to a school in nutrition classes. I started becoming a, a Czech practitioner and I did that for a bit. Things were going well until, and, and this was also a time I started to get into extreme marathon running, cycling, hundred mile bike rides, um, anything extreme along with, I was teaching boot camp three, four days a week. I mean, I, I still was a exercise insane person. I, of course I wasn't being a drug addict at this point, but everything was very extreme for me. If you're going in, I'm going in hard. And, and then things started falling apart. My body started falling apart. I was probably 38, 39, probably at Kitty's age. And I started having all, all sorts of hormonal issues. I started just, the harder I worked, the more my weight didn't want to budge. I was super puffy all the time. And I remember just constantly thinking like, crap, I mean, what is going on? I, I do everything right. And I feel like complete shit. And, um, <clears throat> that's when I went and took a course. I was like my third or fourth course with the Czech Institute, um, in San Diego. And I, I known Josh Rubin for quite some time. And so anyways, I think Josh was probably getting into this as well to, into Ray Pete and a whole different line of thinking. And, uh, I had some conversations with him and all of a sudden I was realizing, wait a minute, this all makes perfect sense. Why I feel like complete shit my body temperature like 96 degrees. I am tired and fatigued and I'm eating lettuce and chicken and, you know, I feel absolutely horrible. So at that point in time, I shifted everything immediately <laughs> and all else went to shit too. When you do, when you switch your diet from basically vegetables and chicken and oatmeal into a more pro metabolic lifestyle within 24 hours, uh, it doesn't go so well immediately. So I learned real quick that all in sometimes isn't the greatest thing to do, but that's how it went. And I shifted and to probably a year later, I mean, everything had improved immensely on me. I felt 20 times better, everything improved. And I started going deeper into the research of it and realized, and I started to shift my practice because I was doing lots of nutritional consults and I was realizing how do I go about starting to tell people that they need to start eating more sugar because it was just such a bizarre thing to do. And I had such a hard time explaining that to people initially. It was like three consults in for them to like wrap their head around that process. And that's when I came up with, I, I need to write something that's a little bit more helpful. So, I mean, because I'm like, I can't, like it's taking five sessions for them to get there. And that's when I decided to write the book. And uh, two years later it came out and it has helped immensely um, in dealing. And, and now it's a lot easier for, I think people, um, and luckily this world has kind of exploded. So it, I think it's a great entry thing for people. If they, they start investigating this kind of way of life to get into, and it helps them understand it at a lot easier level. I second that Kate, cause we recommend all our clients read your book. It's good. I think it, cause you know, like Ray's work for just the average person, it can be a bit hard to interpret, but I think Kate's done a really good job of making it easy to understand. I think it's a really good book too. Definitely. Yeah. I, uh, it was one of the paradigm shifters for me whenever I was initially getting into it. And so, um, I have an immense amount of gratitude to you for that. Um, I didn't know that you and Josh were going to the Czech Institute at the same time. That's awesome. She, Josh was an instructor. So he was actually my instructor for my first exercise, uh, level one course. And then he was an instructor for my health nutrition class. And he was teaching it yet learning a different way of, 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 you know, he, and so he was struggling, I think, because I think what he was teaching was like contradicting what he was learning. And I think, I don't know how soon he left the Czech Institute after that, but um, yeah, and I think, yeah. So that's why I knew Josh. And so he was kind of my entry and I remember I was like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, along this path, 
What do you think are some of the most simple but high leverage things that y'all have implemented that has allowed y'all to kind of move the needle on the spectrum of health, so to speak? Do you want to go, Kitty? You want me to yeah, go? Yeah, Okay, well, I'll just say one thing. I think maybe uh, that I found for myself was that just tracking my food and getting an understanding of how much I was actually not eating because my my thing was I would like chronically under eat for a period of time and then I would binge, um, you know, and I, I obviously realised that I needed to eat more so I could perform in the gym and when I ate more I started to feel better. So just tracking and then increasing my calories and eating every three to four hours and really balancing my blood sugar and making sure those meals were balanced. So, you know, a good ratio of protein, carbs and fat. And when I did that, I just found like, I just slept so much better. My moods were better. Um, I just felt happier. And I just feel like that. And obviously eating, you know, the pro-metabolic easy to digest foods, maybe Kate would maybe talk about that. But yeah, I just really found eating more consistently, eating every three to four hours, balancing my blood sugar, you know, having that before bed snack made such a huge difference for me. And I think it's a pretty simple thing to do too. Like it's pretty easy and cheap, just costs you the food, obviously. Yeah, I would second all that. I, but I would say the biggest revelation for me, because I think all of my life, it, it was such a psychological uh, war going on in my head about what I was going to eat next. When am I going to eat again? And how much willpower can I have to restrict from eating these foods that I, you know, my body is obviously telling me I need, but I'm trying so hard not to eat them. So implementing and adding sugars back in, uh, in like juice, things that I was like, hadn't had in 10 years and, and some sort of, you know, lots of fruit in ways, like I said, that were balanced, but especially adding them in early and not like having my mindset, like, Hey, let's save calories. Like I won't eat a very little breakfast and a very little lunch and save them. Right. Like it was like, okay, that makes no sense when you're trying to like your body, you're trying to fuel your system, but actually giving my body energy when it needed it in the mornings in the afternoons and, and shifting that. Right. Because so many people, Initially, if you've been living in that stress cycle, they're not hungry in the morning, they don't even care about food, but by dinner, they're like eating everything on their sight. But of course, the, that cycle continues and they, they again are not hungry again, but of course that cycle doesn't allow for optimal metabolic function or weight loss. So constantly shifting it and then starting to add so much more food in my at breakfast and more, more carbs and sugars. And all of a sudden, literally, you know, and I was like 39, close to 40 when all this happened, it was like, I don't crave sugar anymore. Like I don't need to hide the ice cream and I don't need to hide the cookies and I can actually have it in my house for people to come over and they can have them because I'm not going to eat all of them. And it was literally something I never thought was possible. I thought it was always going to be this war going on with me, with me and food. And I realized why well, you don't have to do that. And it, that is freeing. <laughs> Like it's an mm. emotional freeing experience that saves all of a sudden all this like space, this mind space that you're giving it is available now for other things. Oh, that's so, I a hundred percent agree with that too. Cause I was like the anti Christ with sugar, but then I would always end up binging on the weekend on all this sugar. And then when I finally, like you say, ate more and, and the juice, drinking the juice, I would just would sit there sometimes and drink the juice and think, Oh, I can't believe I'm drinking this. But then, you know, all of a sudden, like you say, Kate, you could have fudge in the house and ice cream and you would, you have your bowl of ice cream and it's, you just finish the bowl instead of eating the whole entire tub. And I think you're right. Yeah. It's that switching your mindset about the sugar and understanding about sugar and how it works in the body. Cause I always just thought it was poison. You know, I wouldn't eat anything with sugar. Like I wouldn't even eat, drink milk. I'd make almond milk. Everything had to be like, I'd study the sugar content. Um, wouldn't even eat fruit. I just ate blueberries because they were really low <laughs> in sugar. But yeah, you just feel so much better. And you, you're right. You, the binge eating just stops. Binge eating stops. And I think, I mean, the other part that you learn from that is you just start listening to yourself better. I mean, I had the, like, when I started to learn this, I was all of a sudden giving, gave myself permission to rest and to not try to drive myself in the ground that I had to get up and work out. And if I was not getting up, then I was going to, I mean, I, I was so fearful if I didn't work out that I would gain weight, 
I was going to lose my fitness. I was going to, you know, I had all these beliefs in my head about what was going to happen. And then all of a sudden, when I shifted kind of the paradigm shift, I was realizing I can actually do this and I should do this. And I'm like, and then I was mad. I'm like, damn it. I've been doing it all wrong <laughs> for so, so many years. And it was so painful. I never had to do that. <laughs> Do you know, that just made me think about another shift and this is maybe more relevant to, to me. And I think if women are listening to this and they have a similar background to me with the, the bad body image and always being so obsessed with the weight on the scales. And when I met Cray, he really educated me on body composition. You know, Kitty, focus on the body composition, not the weight, because, you know, like you could have two 70 kilo females and one's 35% body fat and one's 25% body fat. And he's like, you know, who's going to look better? Because I always wanted to look toned. You know, I was trying to get that tone in athletic body. Um, and I was just obsessed with being under 62 kilos. And then once I realized that, you know, with the strength training, I actually could train less and get better results. And I always used to get up in the morning and do all this fasted cardio, like every day, six, seven days a week, an hour of fasted cardio, then I do an hour of weight training, but I never really tr strength train properly. You know, like you strength change, Dayton, like we do now where you, you're focusing on performance and being a good technical lifter. Um, you know, and I went from training six, seven days a week for two hours a day to training three to four days a week for an hour, you know, maybe a bit more if I fluff around and then I just walk Winston and I have a much better physique now doing far less and like Kate said you know now it's just easy for me if I feel tired or I haven't had a good sleep I just have a rest you know I just won't train that day because I know that I'm not going to perform well and you know it's not going to be good for my body just adding that extra stress on but just knowing also too that you know you like you say you don't just sack on all the fat if you have a rest day um, and just really focusing on building muscle and training for performance rather than training for weight loss. And now I, act, and obviously this is not going to be the case for everyone. Like I was your real, like Kate, typical restrictor. So I was low body fat, low body weight. So I think, you know, I obviously have gained a fair bit of muscle and strength. So I've gained weight on the scales, but you know, like women who are, and again, like you have to obviously look at people's height. So I'm just pulling this number out, like 75 kilos plus 80 kilos, 90 kilos. You know, they think they need to do all this high intensity cardio to lose body fat. But we've had women in our program, 100 kilos, have lost 30 kilos, simply strength training three days a week, walking, eating like 2,400 calories a day because building lean muscle mass is going to mean that you just burn more fat at rest and that you need, you know, like obviously the more muscular you are, you need to eat more to maintain it. So I think it just, that was a massive shift for me as well. Um, and now I just, oh, I think I look better now than I did before. Um, but I just don't have those body image issues anymore. You know, like I really love my body and it's strong and I enjoy being strong and I find it strength training so empowering. Um, and yeah, I just, look, I've never met a woman who's joined our program and started strength training, got strong and said, I hate it. Definitely. Yeah. I would say like, um, sometimes for me personally, it, it, whenever I take a break and de-stress for a second, uh, and I don't hit the gym whenever I'm not feeling like it, I'll wake up the next day leaner than I was the day before. And mm. I feel so much better. I feel like it's almost cheating. hundred percent. Oh no, you're hundred percent right. I'm the same. Like I say that to Craig, but I, in my head, I always think, well, what's the point of going in there if you can't like perform, you know, that that's just what I think in my head. And I feel tired. Like I may as well just rest my body. It obviously needs sleep or it needs more food or it needs a deload. And then I always, you probably find this too, is I'll have a bit of a deload. I'll come back and I'm really pumped to lift and I'll hit some new PBs because mm -hmm. I'm rested. Definitely. Um, I would also say one of the kind of simple but high leverage factors that I added in, I actually uh, noticed this most significantly whenever I was doing intermittent fasting was um, uh, increasing the amount of salt in my diet. So like I would just mm -hmm. make sure to add salt to like the coffee or the water that I was drinking, which is absolutely disgusting. It's not good <laughs> at all. Um, but I just added the salt and I noticed that um, like I wasn't in a resting sympathetic state as aggressively as I was if I only had the black coffee in the water and was flushing out my minerals. Um, 
So that's something that I've experimented with over probably the past two to three years. And mm -hmm. it's made a significant difference just adding more salt into the diet for sure. Do you ever measure your salt? Cause I like always like, I, I always like to have people measure it <laughs> just so I can yeah, engage. Cause everyone's like, yeah, well, I salt everything. Salt? Yeah, I saw yeah. I go, how much are you having? You're like, oh, it's on everything. I, okay. go, what, what is yeah. it? I go, well, put it, you know, put a tablespoon out and then pull from yeah. it and see what you, you have. And then everyone's like, oh, yeah. it's like two thirds are left. So I'm like, okay, well, we're going to slowly start increasing that because it does make a significant difference. And I remember when I was in my most restrictive years, when I finally did binge, it went like this. I would eat a ton of salty things and then I would want a ton of sweet things and then a ton of salty and it would just go until I was so, so uncomfortably unhappy. But it, those are my top two, salt, sugar, salt, sugar all the time. And you know, now it makes perfect sense because I would deprive myself of both of those things for so long that finally your body is just like, F you. And then your brain just says, nope, we're going for it now. And then you get into that cycle and then you're done. It's not, you can't even control it at that point. But now again, it's like the same thing. Once you, you give your body significant amounts of salt and sugar, right? And again, if you're not consuming tons of salt right now, don't go into a tablespoon or two, like slowly change. But those things make a huge difference. And it's so cheap too. You think salt is like it's so cheap. We find with clients as well, we'll do the same thing, Kate. And they always go, oh, Kitty, I'm eating heaps of salt. And then they measure it out and they're like, oh, I'm actually not eating that much. And they very gradually increase it and their sleep will improve. Um, yeah. And you know what? Salt's so tasty. <laughs> and you think, like, I think, oh, imagine eating potatoes with no salt or like uh, eggs with no salt. <laughs> have y'all ever read uh, The Salt Fix, the book? Craig mm -hmm. has. Craig has it read it, yeah. So that one is really good. He demonizes uh, sugar, which doesn't make any sense. His <laughs> argument, his argument in the book, is not that good. But um, he claims that people in some indigenous cultures are eating upwards of six to eight grams a day in some cases, and like that's it's it's a normality for them. And if they don't have that, then they see mortality rates skyrocket. Wow! Um, so it's really interesting to see like how far you can really take that too. Yeah, I and even say, yeah. no, we Sorry, used to go, consume yeah. a lot more salt before like refrigeration, mm. right? We used to have the meat, everything. We, we used to consume so much more. And then all of a sudden someone decided, hey, I'll remove that salt and your blood pressure will go down. So it became that anti thing again. So people now just think it's not healthy. Mm. Yeah, I think too with training as well. Like I find it helps me recover better from training. Like I'll measure out 15 to 20 grams and have that every day. Like I just put it like Kate says in a little container and I'll just use it over the course of the day. And when I train, I'll have like five grams in my training drink as well. 20 grams? Yeah, of salt, that, yeah. How does that correlate to like tablespoons? Do you know, Jaden? So you know? I think a teaspoon's five grams yes. of salt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So three to four, depending if I train, it would be higher because I have it in the training drink, at least five grams. Um well, it's interesting because like if you look at the kind of like the metabolic theory and sports performance, like mm -hmm. um, the uh, ions, so like you have calcium and sodium um, that basically play a, and magnesium to a certain degree play a role within the muscle to have the contractile response. Um, and so if you're depriving your body of those while you're also trying to strength train, it, it's just it's not going to end well. Mm -hmm. um, there's going to no. be all kinds of misfiring and stuff like that. It's just not good. Mm. No. And you see, like I said, I think that's probably why you end up hearing about people who run marathons and drink copious amounts of water and no minerals and then end up having a heart attack. Mm -hmm. The mineral balance is so off their, their body just doesn't know how to, to work or function optimally. So um, what are some of the things that y'all are focusing on or kind of what's something that fires y'all up right now? that y'all are kind of experimenting with or looking into? Katie, okay, you go. I'm, you go. I'm, I'm you all go. looking into you. What am I getting into? Well, let's see. <laughs> My new theory is from, right now, I'm just into reading the books, which is sad, on depression. Um, <laughs> it's one of the, the serotonin theory, and I think it, 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 it actually – kind of interested me even more during the COVID time because I was starting to think about 
how COVID and, and, and everyone that gets the disease, essentially it, it relates a lot to uh, serotonin syndrome. All of the symptoms are quite similar. And so it just made me look deeper into the entire theories of serotonin and what are we really doing and is it really needed for, for mood and helping and, and is that and ultimately what we're finding out and a lot of the books are saying this is that increasing your level of serotonin isn't necessarily there to improve your mood, of course. And I don't even know if, you know, it seems to me that like half the time when they're talking about these antidepressants that they actually don't know the mechanisms of how they're actually working other than a lot of times it's probably a placebo effect. So it is to me a very fascinating topic um, that, you know, <laughs> doesn't sound very happy, <laughs> but is certainly quite interesting. And because like I said, I, I think we don't really have a good understanding of serotonin and how it functions in our body and why maybe that we need to work on possibly lowering it and to work with people, right? I mean, what we know is, kind of about depression is that the, the one thing that we don't address is people's system and their stress. And if you go in and, and somebody's depressed and yeah, and their, their parent died and they haven't seen friends in a year and they've been inside and they lost their job and all you do is you put them on a medication, you're not really addressing anything. I think you're just numbing them. And so, you know, we can look at serotonin as more of that hibernation um, per se hormone neurotransmitter that again, it's just suppressing metabolic function. And when you, you know, and when we go into hibernation, it's essentially what we're doing. We're getting into that deprived state that so that we can still function. And I think essentially that's probably what it's doing to people is making them feel kind of hibernating, disconnected, able to function, down-regulating the system. I think that's why so many people gain weight when they get on serotonin. And also I think it just makes their libido dysfunctional. So anyways, I, I, that's kind of my next place. I feel like that needs to be talked about more. I feel like if I write a second book, that's going to be a, a, a decent component of it um, because I think so many people deal with that. And, you know, again, I'm not a medical doctor, so don't go running and getting off your antidepressants, but I think it's important to address that, that world because they are so highly prescribed and it's, you know, is it just one more thing we're not really addressing in our, in our bodies and is are, are there other ways that are, that they're safer to help people come out of that. That would be a good book, Kate. That would be, think, we, we need that yeah. book. Yeah, yeah, we have lots of women coming, like even women that come into our program, like Anna's just a, a, this is this is an example. She took them for 20 years and now she's off them, you know, obviously changed her diet, worked with her doctor as well, didn't just stop taking them. Now she's off them. Um, it's just amazing. Yeah, I think you meet, I mean, and again, you do meet people and, and I sometimes just wonder if giving them some sort of medication and you tell them it does something, does that make them feel better? You know, and when you look at the data and you look at the studies that, yeah, most people get a pretty decent effect off of just taking a placebo and they get a decent effect off of, you know, someone that looks like a doctor, it's professional, tells them this is really going to work. <laughs> you know, that is almost just as therapeutic as actually giving them the antidepressant, like, you know, unless they're severely depressed. And, and at that point in time, I definitely correlate depression to a low metabolism. And, mm -hmm. but if their body is in that high anxiety state, as we know, right, you can be super low metabolically speaking, um, health wise, but you could still be burning lots of calories because your system's so hyper stressed. And I think it, you know, those antidepressants can downregulate that. So you, you actually feel more normal. You don't feel so anxious and like go and going, but uh, there's still going to be a disconnect that occurs. You're still in a low metabolic state and, you know, thinking, I guess on some level, it just makes you feel more like you kind of want to hibernate. <laughs> I, one of the things that has always been interesting to me whenever it comes to serotonin is uh, it's found in like wasp venom or like on the outside of the velvet bean. And it causes, mm. if you touch it, it causes irritation to the skin. Like it's super itchy um, or like um, with the snake venom or the wasp venom, like it causes extreme pain. Like that's actually why it's painful is because it has the serotonin within it. Um, and so if it is that detrimental to the outside of our body like what is it actually doing to the inside of our body whenever it's systemic too 
Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. it gives you massive diarrhea for one. I mean, I think you have mm-hmm. that, but like, again, I mean, go look at serotonin syndrome, right? Especially if somebody has a lung disorder because your lungs are your main component of how that detoxifies serotonin from your system. So if your lungs are just, you know, if you have some sort of lung issue and let's say you have some sort of gut issue and you have elevated levels of serotonin occurring and now your lung can't detoxify it. Now that high levels of circulation occur, you basically go into a cytokine storm and you start having lots of blood clots. And so uh, basically you can see where COVID per se, that what is happening. Because what we know is people aren't dying of COVID. They're dying of how their system's reacting to COVID. They're inflammatory response is occurring. And so is this part of the component is, and I think that's why so many anti-serotonin drugs have been successful in relieving people um, of their symptoms and helping them get better during COVID. So I'll get on that book, Kate. What about the sugar book? It's right. It's right there on the list. Yeah. It's right <laughs> all be in the same. Well, you know, I think there's a, because it's like, yeah, I mean, it, Sugar is, uh, it's not directly anti-serotonin, but because it's metabolic, it would, it would certainly get somebody out of some level of depression, right? I mean, how sad are you if you've been told that you need to give up sugar and salt and work out because you see those people, right? Because they're so depleted, get depressed, and they get on an antidepressant. And, I, and I've even seen here, I mean, in Southern California, it's the queen of people and looks and people being fit. And I've had some conversations with women in their 50s look amazing. Um, and they're on five medications because really? they can't get their system, antidepressants, anti-anxiety, sleep medications, uh. um, thyroid meds at some point in time. And they're still on a diet that is very low carbohydrate. They're trying to do intermittent fasting. They're menopausal or a little bit postmenopausal, but they're, they will not, they're in the fight to stay thin. I mean, they're in that fight. And so they have all these things happening, but they're so worried about gaining weight. I go, look, I can work with you, but we're going to gain weight. And it's just, mm -mm, can't do it. I I think, I think too, like that's, and this is not obviously everyone, but like, because women will come to me and go, yeah, but what about this fitness model? Like she looks amazing, you know, and like you say, like they can look good and I'm sure too, like, I don't know, over there, Kate, but they probably pumped full of Botox and fillers and, you know, like it, it, you know, you, you and I have lines, <laughs> like you get I don't to know 40. What you're talking about. <laughs> Look at them. <laughs> well, I know I have some for sure. <laughs> well, you're nine years older than me. When I get to 50, I'll be obviously have more, but you know, like I really, you know, you and I have talked about this and both of us have had Botox and I still, I'll still look at people and go like, Oh, look at her good skin. She's, you know, I fight that urge to, I'll never do it again, but I still have the thoughts but it's deceiving because they probably would look so much more aged if they didn't get Botox and fillers and all that other stuff. It's not a true representation of health. Someone can look good on the outside and look thin and have beautiful skin, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're healthy. Yeah. And I think, yeah. And and at some level in today's world, I don't even think, I mean, you can live a decent long life and you, and you cannot be that healthy. I mean, you know, mm. I mean, I've had these conversations with clients and like, we're all living longer. I mean, we're actually not living longer. Our, I think the, the age is going to go down maybe this year and it might, might even the, the previous year, but we're keeping people alive longer. They're sicker. I think that's what we're doing mm. with medication. That's what the drugs are doing. They're not making mm. people healthier, but they are making them able to live a life and still do things um, with just tons of medication. Mm. Yeah, it's a bit scary, isn't it? So what do you think is the connection between like the centenarians and like the fact that a lot of them might be smoking or drinking or doing whatever with their nutrition, but for some reason they're still living a rather qualitative life at such an old age. What do you think that that might be? I think it's total community. I think I think all of them if you have a tight community of friends and, and, and they laugh, they're happy, it's low stress, I think is probably yeah. something that works within them. Um, they live, I mean, if you look in, and again, the blue zone is here and there, you know, you can take what you want from it. But those communities, they're small communities, they seem to live in lives that are very, almost less industrial, it's more small communities, they're all very supportive to each other, they're probably eating some foods that are local. Um, but, you know, I believe your men, how you view life, if you laugh, 
if you're having fun, if, and if you feel connected to people is probably 50, 60%. I mean, I think loneliness is probably one of the biggest killers out there. I think your, your, your average lifespan drops by like 40% or something if you are lonely or depressed. And mm -hmm. so to have support, um, I think it is one of the, the greatest gifts for people to feel more connected and, and they have a happier life, you know, and just perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, today's world is, is, is different and it's, I think it's quite stressful and you're being hit at all levels and angles constantly with social media and 24 hour news and, you know, depending on what you choose to watch and do. But I think that's really going to affect all of us on some level. And so, you know, you can see it. That's why people are trying to move out and get space and move into a house and, you know, and, and you know, do what they can. I mean, Matt's an interesting, interesting individual. See so how <laughs> But that's what, you know, he's creating this life of, yeah. and, you know, of uh, living off the planet and away from people, you know, and, and so forth. But, and he just got engaged. Who did you say that? Yeah. Who did? To, to, yeah. Ex-girlfriend? The, the girlfriend yeah, no, they was, Well, he, they, I think, seen each other for a while and then they had some time apart and then got back together and okay, yeah, yeah. now they're I wasn't engaged. Sure what, okay. I wasn't sure. Yeah. Well, good for him. So he won't be so lonely out there anymore, obviously, because it's only him. But I think, like Kate and I talk about this too, it's the stress. The low stress, like you and your body can tolerate, you know, not so optimal foods when you're not stressed. Like if you lived on this beautiful farm and you didn't have the money troubles and, you know, the stressful job where you're working from bloody 6am to 9pm and not getting any sunlight and, you know, it's like, like you say, our environments are so stressful, I think, and the social media and yeah, there's just so much other shit going on that stresses like, I don't really know anyone. I think about the women that come into our program, like they're all stressed. They've all got shit going on, you know, like working, trying to raise kids, money, worrying about money. Then they're worrying about their body. It's insane. Yeah. I mean, I, I, like I said, everyone has got their bucket. And if you have low stress on other levels of your life and, you know, and I have friends that they, they don't work. I mean, that they're parents, but they have plenty of time. They go on vacation all the time. I mean, they have mm -hmm. a lot less stress going on in their life. And then, so you don't have to eat as optimally. Um, they eat well, but you don't have to be completely, you know, crazy about it on every level, you know, and of course everything does help, you know, but you do have to ask yourself sometimes if your, if your diet ever does start to feel stressful, <laughs> then mm -hmm. you kind of have to rein it back a little bit, right? Like do what you mm -hmm. can. It doesn't feel like you're making yourself more crazy with whatever you're doing, depending, you know, even this, like I said, this, I always refer to this as a pro metabolic anti-stress diet because it is, you know, supported with sugar and digestible foods and salt and so forth. But if you are making yourself absolutely crazy, trying to be perfect or whatever you think that is, then you've got to rein it back a little bit. And we got to find that happy medium for you because you know, that you take, that's the whole point just to make less stressful. <laughs> I did this podcast with this chick, Amy. She's really awesome, Amy Bow. And we were just talking about this yesterday. Um, like, and Kate and I have talked about this before. Like, I'm pretty, really diligent with my food. Like, eat re pretty regularly, you know, all the time, you know, eat the, eat the bloody liver and oysters and that carrot salad. And, like, I'm pretty religious with my sleep too. Like, I'm on at 8 o'clock. I'm like, nah, Craig, it's time to go to bed. Like, you know, I've got this routine where we, <laughs> you know, because sleep's so important. But I think like our, we've got these businesses, it's stressful, we work long hours, we train heavy and hard and I just never get sick ever. Like I can't even, I think the last time I remember getting sick was I had tonsillitis at bloody Upper Mount Grabat and we had the gym. That's the only time I can remember really getting sick. And I think like you say, like the more, say like stress you're putting on yourself, the more diligent you have to be with those things and it really does help. And I, we were just talking about like, oh, fuck, imagine if we, you know, we're eating 1500 calories and chicken and broccoli like we're used to. Yeah. You know, I just remember always getting so much, so much sick often when I ate like that. It's just amazing what you can do when you support your body. Yeah. I and mean, I think that's the whole point. When you do eat better, you can be more resilient. So you can add more mm. crap onto your day. If you, want to. <laughs> yeah. or you, you can, I mean, you can do more when you are healthier. You know, you, if you, if you, if you don't take care of yourself, you, that you're not going to be able to withstand it. You're eventually going to get sick. You're eventually going to fall off. You're eventually going to have to do something, you know, it's yeah. really the balancing act. I just like to have this high capacity for output, you know, like for work. <laughs> totally. It's also good. You only know, feel so much better today. I had a good sleep last night, you know, 
I've eaten plenty of food. I just, you feel, just don't you reckon you feel happier? Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So what does an average kind of day in life look like for y'all right now? Do you want to jump me to go or you go? My average day. I'll go. See what, what the happens. I get, it depends. Like I might get up, I might see clients as early as seven up till nine. I'm trying to make them later these days, but in the gym, in the no, gym. Okay? No, I see mo okay. most of the people I see now. It's mostly, um, virtually. I, mm. I do see some people, um, uh, personally, but most of them is all virtual. So I literally wake up, I take my dog out and I take her for a walk. You know, I, I then make breakfast. I make her breakfast a little sourdough eggs. I am like cottage cheese. I am like religious coffee. I mean, a little juice and coconut water in the morning. Um, and then I sit, eat, and I usually get on and I check Instagram because <laughs> I usually I always, all my posts are timed. So I wake up and I just make sure nothing crazy has happened <laughs> so, because that sometimes happens. And so then I'll get on first call and I usually will have two or three sessions. Then I take a lunch Again, you know, the, the beauty of working from home, the way I do appreciate is I can just go and make my own food whenever I like. So, and a lot of times I'll have it. I don't know what I had lunch. I had a, a uh, mozzarella fruit and tomato cucumber with cheese and actually had a little chicken in there, a uh, big old salad for lunch today with a cup of milk. And mm. then, uh, then I might run some errors and then I usually will do another session or two. So I like to do four or five and then I do, you know, I, I like to do a little research. I like to listen to a podcast, get on social media. I always write a post. So the day is like eight or nine hours. And then I try five or six o'clock. So I just shut it all off. Um, and so, and I, especially during the winter, I'm an early bird. So I will literally take showers at six or seven. Well, usually after I walk my dog again and it's like, you know, there's nothing going on. I'm like in pajamas. So I tell, I mean, the, the, the years I used to have, I go, I am so excited, not excited. I'm so happy that I was all out 24 hours a day before living it up, spending, you know, going to the parties, every single one wouldn't miss them to the clubs all. And I just don't have that urge anymore. You know? So I'm like, okay, done. And then I'll get ready. And then I might read a book for an hour or two. And then I try to get in bed by nine or 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Super crazy, exciting at this point in my life. <laughs> But, you know, I honestly, half the time I'm asking myself, what would I rather do? Would I rather read and learn something or am I going to go out? And, you know, and I'm like, I don't really want to read that book on depression or, <laughs> you know, anti, I mean, that's where my brain goes. And so that's what I go do. Mm. Well, I'm pretty similar to Kate. We have a like pretty good routine now. Like we get up at 5.30 every day because we're in bed early. So we get up, we, the alarm goes up at 5.30 Winston hears us that we're awake. We let him into the room. He gets up on the bed and has a cuddle. We have the red light on for 10 minutes. We take our temperature and pulse and we're like, we put it in our app because we're testing the app now. Um, and then I get up and go downstairs and have breakfast, which is eggs and cheese, fruit, coffee, collagen, sugar, have my supplements. Um, then I go for a walk with Winston and then I come back, have my carrot salad. <laughs> Everything's around the eating. Then I start work. <laughs> Then I'll have my lunch at 12, 12.30. Then if it's training, I'll usually train like an hour and a half after lunch, then back to work. Um, and then, yeah, finish, I have my afternoon tea. Um, I eat pretty similar shit every most days. Like I just rotate my stacks and I just am obsessed with lamb and oxtail stew at the moment. Like I've just eaten it every day for months. I have it with potato, cooked in ghee and fruit. Um, and then yeah, afternoon tea and I drink heaps of juice. We love orange juice. Uh, we go through, I reckon like, oh, we order like 16 kilo boxes of oranges at a time and juice them. And we, we eat them as well because we just love oranges. Um, and then we usually I'm nagging Craig to finish work. Like I'll start doing the dinner. He finished, he finished. Like he's just, he just gets obsessed. Like he's obsessed about the app and he's making new changes to the program and, so then I make dinner and we sit down and we'll usually like have a bit of a chat and then sometimes we might watch a little bit of TV for like 20 minutes and then eight o'clock we're upstairs. I'm nagging him again. To get, <laughs> I'm like, go, so have a shower, you know, do the bedtime routine and then have the red light on again, read a book, fall asleep and then rinse and repeat. 
same. Pretty boring. I just really like routine. I really thrive on discipline and structure and routine. Um, yeah, it just gives me certainty. I don't know. I just really like it. Yeah, I well, think at this time, of, uh, you know, of our ages, that <laughs> my I think my life was so non-routine before and so chaotic. So when you get into a place where you actually enjoy where you're at and you enjoy what you do and you feel good and you're not constantly in a, you know, the mindset of what am I need tomorrow? What am I need time? Oh, yeah. I really want those cookies, cookies, cookies. I mean, like <laughs> in my brain, get the cookies, get, just go have a good bite of cookie, go get it, go get the cookie. I mean, it was like, and I, and I know, and maybe men don't experience that. I, you know, I'm sure some do when you, but I mean, women, you know, I can't tell you how many women will constantly tell me like that. You just, you know, that's my story. Like, that's my story. And it's like, it's obsession that you're in. Yeah. And it's, it's, it sucks the life out of you. Yeah. It's exhausting. <laughs> I remember I used to drink cups of tea and suck sugar-free mints at work to try and stop me from like, you know, get through the hunger and the cravings one. And then I would just cave. I remember one time I ate, you guys won't know what these are, but crunchy bars, they're these like, cause I really love honeycomb, honeycomb and chocolate on the outside. I ate eight in one sitting. I was just like, so just depleted and fuck, I've had some epic binges of UK. Like I'd put away um, and I'd have all these favorite things that I buy. Like there was this brand of like corn chips that I'd buy and then I'd get pizza and I'd have to have ice cream and I'd eat the whole tub and I'd literally eat till I felt sick. And then I'd do this thing where the next day I'd just eat protein mm -hmm. only. Mm -hmm. So I'd just eat kangaroo, chicken, like oh, I just think about all the dumb shit that I've done. I took that, I don't know what it's called, but you poo out any fat you, you eat. So it would like be this oily orange oil that would come out and you poo. It's disgusting. Took Duramine. Oh, just dumb shit. Like oh, I used to smash those konjac noodles. Do you, do you guys have them in the States? They're like these like calorie free, high fiber, mm -hmm. just no calories. So I'd do a big bowl of them when I was hungry, steam a heap of broccoli, put it in and then heaps of salt and soy sauce. So I'd have mm -hmm. that diet oh, yeah. jelly. Soy sauce was like the condiment. Oh, it was. It Everything. was like, and you, you just fill up and then you just have the shits because it would just like just go, <laughs> go straight through. I'd, I remember when I worked on site and I was after I'd competed and I was just really fucked in, like just so, because, you know, you're just restricted for so long. And it was this, it, it was when we just started working there. So they had this awesome budget. So the mess hall just had the best food just this amazing buffet spread. So I'd starve myself all day. And then obviously I'd, cr I'd crumble in the night and I'd just eat and eat and eat ice cream, all this amazing food. And then I'd go back to my room and make myself throw up. It was the worst. And I'd take laxatives. Yeah, I would say uh, whenever I had the binge tendencies, I would go hard one day and then I would just fast through the next day <laughs> or like the next couple of days. Um, to like equal it out in my mind. Um, so what, what's the longest fast you've done, Jayton? For, so for like non uh, psychological reasons as, as like testing myself and kind of seeing how I deal with certain scenarios in my mind, um, 48 hours was, was probably just water. Longest. Yeah, just water. Do, just water. water. That's mm -hmm. amazing. I've only done 24 hours because I did isogenics, sold I it for 12 months. Yeah. Totally. I, uh, and you know, there you go. Another thing you have in common. Yeah. And you, you know, you'd be like, oh, you've just got to get part. And then you'd just be running off the stress hormones. You know, <clears> you'd be feeling really alert. And then you'd wake up the next day and be like, just crapping on to everyone about how you feel so amazing and you should fast. But like and, the seventh day, I think, because you like fast two days, eat like a sh <laughs> two shakes and a meal, and then two days of fasting. And so by the end, you're like, I couldn't sleep because I'd be like starving. And I had, they'd give you those little chocolate, like. Yeah, to suck on. Yeah. Suck on. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm, these are so good. I'm like, they are not good. But it, <laughs> your brain is like just food, just anything. Yeah. And I'd go do some fasted cardio. It was perfect. Oh, of course. And you train. And I think, oh, fuck, how did I used to train? Like two hours I'd train. I'd get, you know, I'd split my cardio into three 20 minute blocks and I'd do super like high intensity. So I'd get on the treadmill, I'd sprint for 30 seconds and I'd jump off to the sides and I'd sprint. Then I'd get on the elliptical and I'd do that. And then I'd get on the bike road, go hard for 30 seconds, an hour. Then I'd go and do train weights. But obviously back then I wasn't lifting anything near what I was lifting now. And then I'd, for breakfast, I'd have a quarter of a cup of oats, a quarter of a cup 
with some blueberries and pro- a scoop of whey protein powder and water. And I would it, get at the gym. I'd put the water in. I'd just shake it and I'd just eat it like that and then go to work. And I'd be like, fuck yeah, I'm so good. <laughs> you know, I'd just <laughs> like smash more coffee and then eat my, you know, boiled eggs with green capsicum because red capsicum had too much sugar. Like what a mess. What a mess I was. But then on the weekend I'd go out and, you know, get blind and smash heaps of drugs and then I'd just eat. I'd have one day where I'd be like, oh, this is my like cheat day and I'd just eat whatever all day and then it'd be like back to that, you know, back to that regime again. (laughs) Fuck. How? It makes me sick thinking about it now. Definitely. I I would say, so for me, I was at university during this time and we had buffets. So like you could just walk into the mess hall and it was buffet style every time. Um, And chocolate chip cookies are my weakness. I would would just load up like 10 of those suckers onto my plate after I'd already like piled up this giant meal. Um, It was, it was not good. And then like, whenever I would go through the fasting period, I would wonder why I wasn't going to the bathroom. Like I was constipated the entire time. It, it, it was a nightmare. And then like you're, you're psychologically, you're hungry, but physically like your body's just full and bloated from that. Um, so I would say like, that was probably the time where I was like, something definitely has to change. Like something's definitely got to go because this is not working. Do you well, have it, it works yeah. until it doesn't work. I mean, I think that's the whole, the trick of it all is that it, I mean, the, the few times I kind of dieted down and more for photo shoots and so forth. I mean, and I, you know, I would just n- barely eat or, you know, like, and, and I, and I found some old logs of mine that I had like locked and it was like, you know, I, I, I would slowly get down from like maybe 1800 calories at my max. And then I would, when I would diet, you know, I would slowly start just cutting it, cutting it, cutting it, cutting it, cutting it. And I remember like reading one of my things, like it's surprising how not hungry I am at 1200 calories. Right. And, and I would see, I mean, I was like very volumizing full food because that's what they were always told. Just fill yourself up like air popcorn and like lots of steamed vegetables or fibrous vegetables, anything that would fill your, your stomach. Um, that would be the thing that would make you feel. And I was always like, God, it's not really working. Like I still <laughs> feel my belly feels full, but I feel like I want something like if that's not right. And then obviously it's because my blood sugar is so whacked out. And that's why that was happening. But you know, it ultimately it was just like volumizing foods, 1200 calories. I do the photo shoot and literally I'd be driving home like, what am I going to eat? And I would get home and I would make like four or five peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, you know, and it would be like, oh my God, this is the best thing ever. And I eat it. And I'm like, oh, I'll make another one. And I would like, I mean, it would be like 2000 calories, like in within an hour of mm. peanut butter and bread. And, and I would put whatever. And then I'd just be like, what is next? I'm like, cereal. It'd be all this fun stuff, cereal or ice cream. Until you finally, and I rotated the saltiness, potato chips as well. And, you know, it'd be a good four or 5,000 calories, I'd say, until you're mm-hmm. just like, oh, you feel sick. Oh, yeah. You just feel so gross, eh? So depressed. You just be like, oh, I hate myself now. I can't believe I did that. Yeah. You know? I'm never doing it again. Would you, never, I'd, again never every it again. Sunday night, I'd be like, till next week, because like, I, yeah, you'd eat and eat and eat. And I'd, in my head, I'd be like, it's okay, just keep eating because you're never going to do this again, ever. Uh-huh. And then Monday would start mm-hmm. and I'd get to the next week and it would happen. I'd be like, never doing this again. It's like fucking Groundhog Day. <laughs> well, and, and I don't remember, I, I remember actually remembering when I would be doing it and I'd be eating and I'd be like, you're so not even hungry anymore. Yeah. But I couldn't even stop. I couldn't stop yeah. eating. Like I couldn't do it. It would be like, nope, we're just going to keep going. You know, it like would taste good in my mouth, but I wasn't like hungry. I could feel that I was just like, no, we're just going to keep on going. It was just this weird. And I think it, it's so neurological, like your brain, you've, you've pushed it past that point and it's finally getting fuel and everything that's been wanting. And it just is like, no, there's no, there's no stopping point at that point. And it just, you can't, you can't do it. Which you, cause you think, you know, you're like, Oh, I'm going back to my diet tomorrow. Like this is the last time I'm ever going to eat this. So you're like, got to enjoy it. You know, got to get, spend the next two hours just eating everything that I can. Domino's yeah. pizza. I used to love ordering dirty Domino's pizza. <laughs> the same with the biscuits too, Jake. Like we have a, um, sh- like a supermarket here, big chain supermarket called Woolworths and they have this bakery and they make the same, like those biscuits with 
chopped chips, but they're like, you look at the ingredients and like it's canola oil and flat, like it's just so dirty, but they're so delicious. And they made these M&M ones and I was the same. I'd buy a whole packet and just sit there and eat, or cookie dough. I'd buy cookie dough and just eat the dough. Or Jersey caramels, they're another one. You know how you just have all these things and you but now like obviously I enjoy food and have, I think, oh, I look forward to my ice cream, but I never really now have these like, oh my God, I have to have this if I don't have this. Like I sometimes go, I really want to have some pizza, nice sourdough pizza or, you know, whatever, but it's just that like crazy urge is gone. Those crazy ass cravings are gone. (laughs) Have you ever had, and I've had this with a few clients and they're like, you know, because they would used to enjoy, they'd get so excited about their big dinner out, you know, and they would just really enjoy their food. And it was just this, and they're like, I don't, they're like, I don't really have that experience anymore. You know, almost on that, like, that's sad. They have, they, yeah. they're not that excited. And I go, it is, it is kind of like, because your body is now nourished. It's like, you don't get that high that you do anymore. I go, because the other way I'd always explain it, like, it's like being in a, in a relationship with someone that's totally dysfunctional. It's like, you, it's like high, you're high as a kite with them or you're low to the ground. It's either horrible or it's amazing. And so now you're in a functional relationship. So you might not get those high highs anymore, but you certainly don't get those lows. It's like stable. You feel good. You feel safe. It's all good. Your body's happy. And I go, it's the same thing when you're actually nourishing your body, you have that same experience. You don't get those highs anymore. You know, the where you're, you go out to dinner, you're just like, I can't wait to eat that burrito. And yeah. now they're just like, I don't have that same feeling. <laughs> like they're almost sad. I'm like, so you're telling me you're regulated, you feel good, you don't, but you don't want to go out and eat like 17 burritos. No, I'm like, oh, but maybe that's a good thing. You know, so yeah. yeah. That, I've actually never thought about that cake. So I think that about myself now. Like we'll go out for dinner and it's just you go out for dinner or we'll go out for breakfast, you just eat and it's just you eat the meal and you choose whatever. But it's not like I, like I was the same. I used to go out to eat and be like, oh, and all, but it would end up being binging as well. Like I'd eat and then eat and eat and eat. But now you just go out and you're just like, oh, you, you enjoy the food, but it's, you can stop while you eat and you stop and you fall and you're not like, oh, this isn't the last time I'm going to eat delicious food because I eat delicious food every single day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's not dysfunctional any longer. It's yeah. functional because dysfunction has lots of highs, but it also has a lot of lows. And so mm. when you take it into function, those peaks dissipate a little bit. And so now mm. you don't have that same experience. It's a better experience, right? But mm. usually the same thing with functional relationships, right? You don't have the chaos, but you, you know, and maybe you don't have that like crazy insane with each other, but usually that's not very healthy either, you know, but it's, it, it just kind of mellows out in a, in a better way, in a, in a safer and in a, in a functional and a healthy way. That's so true. Yeah. Yeah. Like when you first start seeing someone, you know, when you're like really into them and then obviously as time goes on, like Craig and I talk about this, especially when it comes to sex, you know, like you just want to have sex all the time when you first meet. And then obviously after time that wears off because it, but it becomes deeper. But yeah, sometimes like we'll just talk about like, oh, I remember when we first got together and we just like have so much sex and you know, obviously it's not the same now. It's still good, but it's not that same high but you're just so much more comfortable and it's deeper and yeah, but you yeah. guys have a functional, but did you ever date anyone where it was r- just an unhealthy human? Like I've done, I've dated yeah. many unhealthy humans. So yeah. I know. And it's like, you, it's high as, and, and I remember I would go to a therapist and they'd be like, if you ever have that feeling of like, like, Oh my God, like it was just a crazy feeling. They're like, you should run from that person <laughs> because they're usually, they're about to express to you everything that, you know, they're, they're going to project to you on some level, everything that you have maybe an insecurity about. And, and it's, they've always, that's always been the case. And so those people that you get to that level of high, that it's almost unhealthy, they're probably going to take you to a, a level of a horrid level of whatever. So at least my experience, you know, can maybe. Oh, no, it's so true. That. Yeah. <laughs> no, I would agree with that too. I mean, I've only ever had two relationships my whole bloody life and the rest of the time I just shagged men. So I don't have a lot of experience with, rela- with relationships, but I would chase toxic men and sleep with toxic men, you know, and have that high and then they, you would go back and back. I would go back anyway. Just. Uh. So there you have it. Come a long way. <laughs> I would say uh, one of the things that. What about you, Jaden? Have you slept with a lot of toxic men or had a lot of, you know, like. What? Um, <laughs> no men. No men. Yeah. Um, Maybe women then. Maybe you've had some. Do you have a partner? 
Uh, I do not know. Um, I've actually, I've never really had a relationship. Um, like most of my life has been spent focusing on myself. And mm -hmm. so um, I have very good relationships with my family, which is, which I'm really grateful for. Um, but at the same time, I don't really have a desire. Like I'm still trying to cultivate the self-love that I want so I can kind of pull from an abundance, so to speak, if that makes sense. Well, there yeah. you go, ladies. Jaden's single. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For anyone who's listening. <laughs> Follow me on Instagram. At <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. um, yeah. I would say one of the things that I'm kind of grateful for is like, I, there's not a trigger for the binge anymore. Like I don't snap mm -hmm. anymore. Um, which, uh, I'll, even if I go out and eat something with some friends or some family that isn't pro metabolic, like I don't freak out anymore. Um, mm -hmm. and I think that that is, whenever you know that you're starting to do things right. It's like whenever something doesn't go unplanned and you can adapt to it very well um, and not stress over it, then you know that you're in a pretty decent place. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that is, so I true. think that, that's literally, I think one of the biggest gifts, I mean, I think is that you can eat anywhere, eat anything. And if it's not perfect, that's okay. You know, I, and I think you can just understand like, this is okay. My, I need some sort of nourishment. Maybe it's not the best, but I need to at least stay regulated or, or I need to go out and enjoy this meal um, mm. and enjoy the company because quite honestly, that experience in itself is going to be so pro metabolic because it's enjoyable. It's happy. You feel good. The feeling is nice, everything about it. And, and that alone is what nourishes your body. It's just not food. It's company and community and environment and nature and all these other things that can be essentially pro metabolic. Mm. Yeah, that's so true, isn't it? Like, I think sometimes it's so easy just to get focused on the nutrition and the training, but you forget about like, how are your relationships? You know, are you getting out in nature? Do you know that you're part of a community? Cause I always know, like, I feel the best when I, after I see my friends or my family or like, even when I chat to you, Kate, you know, I always walk away feeling like, you know, you've got a good energy. I like your energy and you just feel more connected. I think when you're connected to other humans, you just feel happier. You know, are you doing fulfilling work? Do you like, enjoy your work? Do you have some hobbies that you like? Like those things, I think, are just like we've seen it too. Kate and I talk about this a lot, like women in our program, they're doing everything right with the training nutrition, but like they've got this toxic relationship with their partner or they just hate their work so much and it's so stressful. It really impacts them and their, and their overall health. Um, yeah, it's like don't forget about those things as well. Yeah, and don't forget about you in the sense that even if they're doing all their nutrition and their training, it's like, you know, so many women because your body shifts sometimes and mm -hmm. sometimes if you're used to being 110 pounds at five foot nine right and maybe that wasn't supportive weight for you maybe you liked that weight but you know when you go through a healing process you might be gaining some weight and maybe that's what's a healthier weight for you but a lot of women are very hard on themselves and their self-talk and the way they speak to themselves to loud i mean and i go look that's just going to be another stress to your system by being so mean and toxic to your own self and beating yourself up because you're worried that you'll never be at 105 pounds, you know, and totally thin. I go, I go, you know, it's, it's, it's a process of not only adjusting, but learning to love yourself at maybe this new body or this new physique doesn't mean you, you can't have a good physique because you can, mm. but mm. It, to not be so attached to a, the scale, the physicality, and to really get in touch with your feelings and your, and you, a lot of the other things that kind of go with this as far as your sleeping and your mood and all these other things. But again, you know, if you want to constantly focus on one thing, which is your scale and your weight, you're going to lose sight of what you're trying to get out of this process um, because mm -hmm. you're going to, you, you're going to be so attached to that number. You're going to miss the, all the benefits of, of getting in. Plus you're just going to stress yourself. Like chronically all day long of the way you're talking to yourself. hundred mm, percent. Well, um, Kate, Kitty, I really appreciate y'all hopping on here with me today. Um, thank y'all for y'all's time. Where can people find y'all on social media, website, all of that good stuff. 
Uh, well, you can find me <laughs> at Kate. You hear that? That's my dog. She's, She's so cute. Uh, KateDeering.com is my site and uh, Facebook and Instagram at Kate Deering Fitness. And I am on there pretty much five days a week. And, you know, so if you have questions, I usually am pretty good about answering them. You can also email me through my site. Um, I'm happy to usually uh, give you some sort of response back. Certainly, uh, my book is a plethora of information. It's always a good place to start if you're kind of getting into this approach. And you can buy that on Amazon or Barnes and Noble. And it's like, or you can get it off my site. And I will have a link to her book, How to Heal Your Metabolism, in the show notes as well. So uh, feel free to use it there or find it there. Cool. And our website is newstrength.com.au. So it's N-U-S-T-R-E-N-G-T-H. And my Instagram is just Kitty Bloomfield. Or it's pronounced Bloomfield, but it's spelled with one O just to be confusing. So K-I-T-T-Y-B-L-O-M-F-I-E-L-D. And you also have a supplement company, Saturay. Oh, yeah. Right? Sorry for about that. Bloody Saturay. So that's Saturay, S-A-T-U-R-R-E.com.au. And, yeah, we've got collagen and casein, liver, Cascara, and we're just so close now to doing the skincare. We're just finalizing the designs and sourcing the packaging. There's just a million things that you don't think of. Um, but we've finished, we've formulated it, and Emma signed it off, which is awesome. So that's exciting. Uh, you know, pure for free skincare. Got all these cool pro metabolic actives in there. Um, niacinamide and cholesterol and all this. Emma's done a really amazing job. I'm super excited about that, mind you. I'm ready to get oh. that. I'm fucking so ready. It's been like a year and a half. Every day I'm on Emma. I'm like, where are we at with this? You know, I'm so impatient. (laughs) She's probably like, fuck off, kitty. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's getting there. She's really into the detail, which is good. I'm not into the detail. (laughs) I'm just like, let's keep going. Um, but yeah, so I reckon two months it'll be out if all goes to plan. Awesome. Heck yeah. And we're currently recording this in, what month? it's April. So what's June sometime in June, 2021. Mm. Sounds good. Awesome. Fingers crossed. What? Heck yeah. Yeah. Well, and all, and for all your French listeners, I mean, cause people keep asking me too. I hope that we will have the French probably within 30 to 60 days. We should have the French, how to heal your metabolism out. So look for that. If you are in French or Canada or anywhere else, I guess Belgium that speaks French. Heck yeah. Well, thank you all again. And I look forward to talking again soon. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you haven't already, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and leave a comment down below if you want us to cover a different topic.